Hello, everyone. Welcome to Science at the Theater's Hot Technology Cool Science, brought to you by the Friends of Science at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, also known as Berkeley Lab. My name is Jeff Miller, and I'm head of public affairs. Uh, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, which are the Chabot Space and Science Center, the Exploratorium, Lawrence Hall of Science, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, University of California, Berkeley, Albany High School Science Department, Berkeley High School Science Department, and Oakland High School Science Department. Thank you all very much. Uh, Kathy Yellick, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. I told you as we started, um, I have a green computer. Kathy is going to talk to us about green computing and green computers. Um, my green computer was painted that way by me uh, one Friday evening because I had nothing better to do. Uh, your green computers are different. <laughs> yes, our, our green computers are green because we're trying to build computers that are very energy efficient. And um, we use a lot of computers at Berkeley Lab. Um, in fact, all, all of the science activities that you hear about are, um, many of them involve some type of computing. So just to give you some idea of that, um, we use computers at Berkeley Lab and also in, in other laboratories for um, solving problems that are either too big to experiment with. So there's an example of a picture there of black holes, so something that's very large and you can't just run experiments on black holes. Um, something that is uh, too small to be able to see. Um, pro some of the proteins and diseases, sometimes you can, you can see them, but sometimes you can't. Um, things that are too fast or too slow or too expensive um, to, to try to do an experimental uh, facility. So one example would be designing airplanes. So when you design an airplane, um, it used to be that you would design one and kind of experiment with it and see whether it worked well. It's, it's, um, in fact, what they used to do is take airplanes and they would fold the wings up. Um, and so they touched, and then they would t to determine whether or not the wings were going to fall off in such a high-stress situation. Well, that's a very expensive experiment because you normally don't use the airplane after you've done that with it. So um, now they, they instead use a lot of computers to design airplanes so that you don't have to throw the first one away. Simulations. You do simulations with the computers. And it's very energy intensive, I understand. That's right. And, um, so we use in computers also to try to solve some of the energy problems, such as designing energy efficient combustion engines, but it's it's also true that the computers themselves consume a lot of energy. And um, so a, a, uh, something that may, maybe those of you who are in the audience may not be familiar with trying to do computer simulations for problems like this, but um, you probably are very familiar with trying to do a Google search. And behind that Google search is a large data center um, that may consume 40 to 100 megawatts of power in order to run the computers in that facility, um, often uh, uh, built right next to a hydroelectric plant so that you can um, get, get a lot of power very easily. And that, that consumes um, a tremendous amount of energy behind all of the searches that people are doing. And the labs, the kind of computers that we use also consume a lot of energy to solve some of the very large um, computing problems that we have. And makes a lot of heat too, I understand. That's right. There's a lot of heat that's um, dissipated out of the computers. If you go into a, um, a computer room, of course, you have, um, they're, they're, they tend to be very cold because there's a lot of air conditioning mm -hmm. used. And one of the things that um, we're trying to do is to make those computers more efficient so they don't dissipate as much heat. How, how do you do that? How do you make a computer more efficient? Gosh, my computer at home's got all these little itty bitty parts. How do you make it even smaller or better or faster? Right. Well, you know, I think that, um, that one of the problems that we've had um, in the, the way that we build computers today is that they weren't designed for energy efficiency. Um, even something like your laptop, so there's a, there's a Macintosh laptop and I have one of those um, that I use. If you put that on your lap, it gets very hot. I, you know, I think calling these things laptop is a little bit of a misnomer at this point because um, they generate a lot of heat. And, um, and that's because there's a lot of heat being wasted in the process of running the computers. And that's happened for various um, technology reasons that the, um, that the, the uh, um, the process that, that, uh, that's used to design the chips, um, we've, we've tried to make them smaller and smaller, but in order to try to do that and run the, and run the uh, to keep up with Moore's Law, we're trying to run the clock speeds faster and faster, and when you do that, that takes, um, uh, that takes more energy um, to run the computers, and, um, and more of the energy is actually wasted as you make those, as you make those very small and um, very fast. So, so there's more energy that's being wasted in computers, and we're trying to um, understand how to design computer systems and are designing them, uh, computer that are more energy efficient. Now, most of you also have a very energy efficient computer, um, and that's your cell phone. 
So your cell phone has actually a very powerful computer in it today. Um, and the, the difference between um, the kind of computer that's in a cell phone and the kind of computer that's in a, um, in a data center, let me see if I can show you a picture of this. Um, there's, the, there's a picture of the uh, processor um, that might be inside of a, a data center computer. Um, and that little tiny green thing up in the corner is a processor that might be inside of your cell phone. Um, so you can see visually there's a big difference in the size of those computer chips, those <laughs> processor cores that are in, inside of those two things. Um, but the other big difference is that the cell phone was designed up front with the idea that we really cared about energy efficiency. Whereas the server process, the things that we put in the Google data centers or the Berkeley Lab data centers are um, not designed for energy efficiency because we're plugging them into the wall. So historically we said, well, we don't worry that much about the energy that's consumed in a computer that's being plugged into the wall, um, if you're going to carry it around with you, we worry a lot about the energy efficiency. And this has now changed because everybody, Google, Berkeley Lab, everybody who has a computing center or data center is very concerned about the amount of energy because it's been going up. And so the question is, can we take the kinds of processors that the clever engineers who designed cell phones have built and use that kind of a design to build, um, to build supercomputers? And what have you been able to do here at the lab? What have you learned that lets you see into that solution. Well, we have um, we have learned that there is that there's much less energy that's being consumed in those cell phone processors, and that um, we've actually taken something very close to that cell phone processor design um, developed by a company called Tensilica, and built a variation on that chip that we actually have run um, a climate simulation, uh, a piece of climate simulation on top of that processor. So, although the the idea that you build a supercomputer out of iPod processors or cell phone processors may seem kind of crazy, um, we actually think that you can map them. You wouldn't build the processor exactly the same way, but you can use the same engineering ideas behind um, that are behind cell phone and iPod processors um, to build a processor that you can use for um, physics simulations of various kinds. We've all read about these supercomputers that have basically linked up lots of little computers. Is that the idea? Yeah, so let me give you an example of a problem that we um, try to solve with um, supercomputers, and that is this um, the climate modeling problem. So in some sense, everything we know about climate change, which you've all heard a lot about over the last year or two, um, has come from supercomputers. Because um, uh, before we had supercomputers that predicted climate change, change using simulations, um, we can look at the weather reports. We can say, well, it seems warmer this year than it was last year. But there there was a lot of debate um, about whether or not it was actually climate change. And there were various theories about you know, what was causing it. This is just a cyclic behavior or whatever. Um, but people built computer models that describe what's happening with the global climate change. They run those computer simulations forward for 100 or 200 years, and they can actually um, predict what's happening with the, with the climate. And that's all done on supercomputers, because those are very large and complex um, simulations. Just to give you um, an example of something that is also shows, shows one of the results of the computer simulations. Um, we've studied these, these kinds of um, climate, climate problems, and you might ask, well, if you just simulate forward 100 years from now, how do you know that you're simulating anything that's real at all? And so one of the things that's been done, a, a project at, um, at, at running on computers at Berkeley Lab is a project that was um, reproducing the, the um, data back 100 years. So this is looking at data that started about 100 years ago, and on the left-hand side, here you can see all these little red dots on this this map of North America um, and those little red dots are the actual um, weather measurements that are still recorded so this data is very precious because you can't go back in time and re reproduce the the climate data but but there is a little bit of that data that was was saved probably in newspaper offices and things like that about the temperature and the humidity that day so that data was taken and then it was smoothed out to pr to to fill in all of the missing pieces of the data um, and then the simulation is run forward to, to see whether or not we see the kinds of effects that we know happened historically. So if you watch this movie here, it'll show a hurricane that happened in 1938. Um, and on the left-hand side, you're seeing the, the simulation of that, um, that hurricane based on that weather data. And um, there's the actual hurricane over there. So you can see that the, the climate model actually reproduced um, this, this hurricane event. Hmm. Um, but in terms of your, I guess your question was about um, doing this in parallel. So 
um, these supercomputers. How do, we, how do we build these kind of supercomputers? So this is a picture um, there on the left side of a supercomputer um, that we have at, at NERSC, which is uh, uh, the, the Scientific Computing Center at Berkeley Lab. Um, this is a, a machine built by Cray, uh, one of the supercomputing companies. And um, you can't, this is one of the rows of the Cray machine, and you can see that it, it goes down a ways. Each one of those cabinets is filled with a lot of uh, processors, and there are m many rows of that, so there's about 100 racks um, in that computer. And um, there's 38,000 processor cores. So um, if you were to go out and buy a laptop, you might buy a dual core processor or a quad core processor that's got two or four processors in it. This has 38,000 processors in it for solving these kinds of scientific problems. So how do you do that? Well, for something like climate change, you take a you take the globe um, and you divide it up into roughly 38,000 pieces um, and each one of those uh, pieces of the globe goes on one of those processors and it simulates what's happening in that part of the globe. But as you can imagine, the weather is not independent on each of those 38,000 pieces. So those processors have to communicate with one another and so this is a large complex parallel machine that's put together with a high-speed network to connect the processors together. Thank you very much. Uh, our world is all about computers these days and, and uh, thank Thank you very much for explaining.